dedicated to geeks and nerds, you're listening to Project I Radio, 24-7, Nerdgasm. Bizarre. This is Bazong, the bizarre and weird fiction podcast with me, your host, Mr. Frank. Welcome back, Zongers. Back for another week. Hope you're all having a great time and you're you're in your car or you're Maybe you're having a workout, or maybe you're just sitting behind your desk listening to the latest episode of Bazong. However, you, Bazong, remember to do it responsibly, right? We all got to be safe. Practice safe zonging. Zongers, this week we have an author. He's also an editor, and he's just recently started dabbling in uh, publishing. And also, he's from Australia. That's right. We got him all the way from down under. The one and only Mr. Kent Hill. Kent first came on the scene with Strange House Books and his uh, his book, Alien Smut Peddlers from the Future. And he's since worked with uh, the likes of Riot Forge Studios. And he's also worked with J. Ellington Ashton Press, a press probably more notably known for doing horror. But they, too, are now sort of opening their doors to the idea of publishing the weird and bizarre. So good on them. He's also, like I just mentioned, started his own little publishing outfit. Uh, that's uh, Kent Ill Publishing. And he's putting out uh, a series of books that are all movie-based. And as we'll find out, Kent Ill is a gigantic movie buff. So with that in mind, I present to you the one and only Mr. Kent Hill, all the way from Australia. I'd like to welcome to the Bazong Podcast from far, far away, or very close, depending on where you're listening, one Mr. Kent Hill. Mr. Frank, how are you doing, sir? Fantastic, and how are you? I'm very good, mate. I'm fantastic. I've got my glass of vodka here. There we go. And, I got and, uh, and some onion rings, and we're ready to party. <laughs> this sounds like a party for sure. I got my little martini in front of me, too, so we're, we're doing all right. Very good. Now, Kent, I've uh, I've been watching your, your career, so to speak. Uh, did you come? Okay. I, I first saw you come onto the scene when you joined Strange House Books with your book, Alien Smut Peddlers from Outer Space. Is that your first work? Yes. Well, that was my, my literary birth, you might say. Um, I've been writing for many years uh, before that. Um, mainly screenplays. I was, I was in the film business or, or on the scratch and sniff end of the film business. Uh, for for a long time, and uh, towards the end, I had a lot of work that was sitting there. And a friend said to me, "You know, it would be a shame to to waste all of these ideas. I guess I'll just let them die a dusty death on a shelf somewhere. Uh, why not take the opportunity and convert some of these into books and get them out there that way? It's still storytelling, and you get to with a book basically write, direct, produce, star, edit, do everything yourself." And so, uh, so I went out there and um, tried, of course, all across Australia first, all the publishers and agents and all that sort of thing, and um, was branded most of the time too high concept for their tastes. So I ventured a field and went to England first and tried some publishers there and eventually made my way around to America, which I thought would be probably the most difficult because there's so many um, presses there and so many people trying to get into uh, the different industries. So I really had that last on the list because I, I assumed that, that might be the most difficult. So I started sending uh, things out to the likes of a Razorhead and uh, all of the, the presses that were there, Rooster Republic and Bizarro Pulp. And, and uh, Strange House was, was on the list. Um, and... I always send. I know, I know it's a, a, a it's part of the, the submission guidelines. Most of the time, they're not to send multiple submissions, but I always did because I wanted to show them. That I was very keen to get some attention, or to at least to get them to read something. And so, to Strange House, I as I it was my custom, I sent a lot of submissions, 
Uh, and then eventually it took about, I don't know, three months, three months turned into six months. And then uh, I eventually got that fateful email saying, I didn't even read the bulk of it, I just read the last line that said, we would like to offer you a publishing contract. And, uh, and thus, uh, uh, thus we're here now talking. And it was uh, a little book, Alien Smut Peddlers uh, from the Future. Who would have thought a, a 13 penis, multi-tentacled, uh, pornographic, peddling alien would be my birth onto this scene, as it were? Oh, I would believe that. <laughs> and what was it? What was it that that drew you to to Bizarro in particular? Did you were you aware of Bizarro when you were searching for publishers in Australia and and England? I was aware of Bizarro. I, I had read some Bizarro books, and I was I listened uh, to your interview with Kevin Strange, and I, I I agree with Kevin that when I came across Bizarro, I thought it was very new and fresh and very exciting. Um, not stultified literary stuff. It was more like literary junk food, and I thought that was there was uh, there was something exuberant about it, and I really wanted to, to to get into that. And I thought, well, that's that's exciting. They don't seem to be bothered with convention or or or, uh, or run parallel to anything else. They seem to be creating their own little universe out there somewhere. And I thought, um, although, you know, I mean, I had people that said to me, oh, the bizarre fiction's rather like dolphin painting. Um, but I, I, I thought, no, I think, it's, I think it's new. I think it's exciting. And I wanted to, to, uh, to get, on it, get in on that action, as they say. Now, is that what, we, what you were writing for, for film? You were writing this kind of bizarro already? Oh, no, no. I was, I was, I was trying very fervently to get um, into mainstream movies. I mean, of course, you have your film school wanks, you know, your very artsy, fartsy beginnings, and uh, I was trying to get more into commercial fare. Um, the closest I ever got, it's a story I've told before, was I sold a, a well, I was asked to write a draft of an action film, uh, which I, I got paid probably the most I've ever got paid for writing before. It was around $7,000 at the time. It was quite a lot of money for me. Uh, to do a draft of an action film, this this uh, chappy that I met was um, uh, owned a large scrap metal business and he wanted to become an actor. So he went away and did all the courses and became as close to an actor as he was ever going to get. And he, he managed to get the ear of a couple of producers with this script of his. It was an action movie at the time uh, titled Dead Reckoning. And, of course, I know there's quite a few films called Dead Reckoning. But um, eventually the title became Enemies Closer. And he had garnered the ear of these producers. And I believe at one point uh, Philip Noyce, the director of Clear and Present Danger and Patriot Games, uh, Blind Fury, other films like that, uh, was was tickled. His ear was tickled to some degree, um, and it was rather exciting. We we got to do a bit of a recce on a on a U.S. battleship, and uh, and all sorts of things like that. Uh, but eventually, um, I was lucky to get paid because uh, one of the producers or one of the co-producers was then arrested for fraud. Turns out he'd been embezzling the production money, and so the picture was was never made. It was it was closed down. Um, <laughs> So that was that was sort of the closest I ever got um, to to having you know a screen credit and, and validating myself with the Writers Guild, um, <laughs> and and getting the getting getting my Writers Guild uh, um, equity, you know, being, yeah. being on song with it, being part of the club. Is you know? that? But uh, yeah, sorry. It's is is that still? Uh... A desire of yours to, to, to work in film and, and get a screen oh, credit? Oh, certainly. I mean, um, even though the, uh, Garrett Cook once described me as a straight-to-video pulp smith because uh, straight-to-video films and B-films are very much my, uh, my oeuvre. And uh, so the, a lot of the books that I write are very much that B-type fare, that Fred Allen Ray, Jim Wynorski... Um, Roger Corman type fair, but I mean, of course, I would love to work in 
in uh, in in the big leagues in the in the mainstream, uh, where all that ridiculous money is. So yes. Do you write your your fiction sort of like as a movie in your head? Is that is that how that kind of plays out for you when you write? Well, certainly my my method has not changed from writing screenplays to writing books. I start off with um, basically bullet points or, or scene headings and um, basically write all the scenes out that are going to be in the in the book as I used to do in the film and then basically fill those scenes in. Um, usually, uh, having it, it bulleted out that way, you could move scenes around. Like you look at the structure of your story or the structure of your film and you move scenes around and say, oh, no, that might work better over there and that could be a good turning point and that could be a good reversal towards the end because you want to keep people interested. And so I just applied the same method to writing the books. I would write headings or, or chapter titles and I thought, okay, oh, that, that's a good, a good uh, heading for a chapter and then just fill it in basically, just join the dots. <laughs> and, it, you know, it's, it's been my experience listening to writers and interacting with writers that the typical your typical fiction writer has a you know they want to sometimes explore screenwriting and they have a difficult time making that transaction i guess they find the, the stripped down method of, of screenwriting real difficult to switch over to but it also on the same token and on the flip side of that it seems like screenwriters have a lot easier time switching over to to, to full prose and fiction writing because they're able to build off of those skeletons that they do create. Well, that's true. I mean, um, with screenwriting, you you have to learn the economy of language. Uh, I still carry that over. I try to find... I try not to ramble on, even though my wife will argue with me, saying that at times I do get a bit wordy, but that's, that's probably um, a side effect of, of being able to have a lot more space to work with. Uh, than rather than just trying to write a nice, concise scene description and dialogue. Um, so some of that carries on. Sometimes, yes, I, I you know, do get a bit wordy here and there because I get carried away. But um, but no, the the transition was quite smooth. It's it's I still see the scenes like I have to see, envision it to write it. I can't. I don't just sort of sit there and and think of the words, I think more of the images, and then try and write down the images that I see in my head. Now, after you put out Alien Smut Peddlers, you know, your work takes on a decidedly movie Hollywood feel. You you deal with barbarians and, 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 you know, like the Jurassic Park type book you have, and, of course, you have these series of, of, of dedicated short story collections to B-movies. Is that just your comfort zone? Like, see, see, Smut Peddlers is just, is very, stands out very distinct from the rest of your work, I feel. Yeah, well, I mean, I was, I was going after, with Smut Peddlers, I was going after the, this bizarro uh, genre. I was trying to, I, I saw it as a, as I've said, I saw it as a very fresh and uh, vital new literary world. And so with Smut Peddlers, I thought, you know, and, and because uh, Smut Peddlers was rejected many times before it was published, uh, one publisher said it wasn't bizarro enough. So uh, I sat down and, and, and drank some Southern Comfort and said, okay, you want fucking weird, here we go. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, um, uh, yeah, it became, it became almost a challenge. I saw it as a duel almost, is to, to, to craft this thing so it would be good enough for this bizarro crowd. Very tough to please. Um, so, yeah, it was, it, was, it was very different. It was a story that was in my head for a little while, like the image. I, I, I listened relentlessly to Neil Young's Dead Man School while writing it. I still see it in my head as a black and white film with, like, Dead Man, with, with Neil Young's score for that film magnificent score for the movie dead man and uh so yeah and i, I just saw this i always wanted to write a western i love western so i thought a weird western although it didn't start off as a weird western it started off as a quite conventional western 
and then the elements just got stranger and stranger. Um, the, the, the origins of it is I pitched it to a publisher um, in title only because I had not finished the work at that time. Uh, as often is my custom, I pitch things that I haven't finished and, and usually they're the ones that get, say, oh, yes, yes, oh, how quickly can you get it to us? And so then I have to write like a demon for a week or so and, and finish it um, and then get it to them. Because I say, oh, look, it's finished. Uh, just polish it for you and just give me a couple of days to polish it. Meanwhile, I disappear and uh, and write the thing because it's not done. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, that's how, that's how it, as, as you read it now, that's how it came about. It was, it, was, uh, it was a pitch. That publisher did not pick it up, by the way. Um, they said they liked it, but they said it wasn't what they were looking for at that time. Um, but Strange House liked it. They thought it was funny. Um, Don Noble, who was with Strange House at that time, referred to me as the, the Shakespeare of poop jokes. <laughs> Indeed, there's a lot of poop jokes in it. I love poop jokes. I'm, okay, I think, I think people shitting themselves is fun. <laughs> I don't know what that says about me, but um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So it, they thought it was hilarious and it fit their what they were looking for at the time, which was trauma films and 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 Japanese horror and all sorts of just a, a great mishmash of weirdness. And so I tried to create that with the book. That was definitely a fun little book, and it, it was you know very different from a lot of Bizarro at the time. So then you move on, post uh, uh, Alien Smut Peddlers, you move on to what I like to kind of say is your, your barbarian phase, where you had um, Deathmaster and you had The Last Barbarian. And that was like, <laughs> you, you, you sort of moved back into, let's call it your comfort zone of, of movie-style storytelling? Well, Deathmaster was, was something that had been, oh, was a, it's a, a project that I've felt for many years and, and, and finally realized it with the book that you've read. Um, it was uh, basically a response. It's dedicated in part to Jim Wynorski, who's a friend and, and whose films uh, are a great influence on me. And I wanted, like he did, I remember seeing an interview with him talking about his first directorial outing, which was a film called Lost Empire, and he said, if I never get to make another film, I will put everything I, everything I want to see in a movie into this movie. And so Deathmaster was basically my, the, my embodiment of that theory. Like if I never have another book published or get to publish another book, then I'm going to put everything I ever wanted <laughs> into a book and a film into this book. So it's going to have sword fighting and magic and romance and comedy and a bit with a dog. And... Um, <laughs> And, uh, and try and get that all in there. So if I never get to come back, then I, I, I said everything I wanted to say. So um, that was, that was the, and Deathmaster was a, was a movie uh, script before, oh, wow. it was, um, before it was a book. So. And it, the movie also sort of incorporated that, that, uh, that Pretty much, yeah. Of, I, I uh, wanted to get, as, get everything I could. Right. All the, thi- all the things I wanted to see in a film. Uh, in there, so if I never got to make another one, or if I never had the the opportunity again, or someone chopped off both my hands and whatever, I'd never get to write one again. I'd, I, I'd say I'd said everything that was that I wanted to say. And now, due to that, I mean, you had a little bit more writing, but uh, you you've sort of moved into editing uh, anthologies after that, where you have your series of. Uh, you know, straight to video inspired short story collections. Is that mm-hmm. is that is that because did you like really like blow your nut on that Death Master and and you kind of did say everything you had to say, so you wanted to allow everybody else to step in and and get into editing. Well, How did you make that transition? Well, I, I over the course of the early writing days, I've, I've met quite a lot of wonderful authors who were incredible talents and had so many great stories. Um, as you were talking about The Last Barbarian, I got to write with the wonderful Craig Mullins, people who haven't read him, get out there and read him. I believe uh, he was in um, he was in Strange House anthologies and also is the author of the re- reanimated states 
yeah. of America. He's he's a fantastic author. If you haven't read him, his Trent Gunner stories are fantastic. If you haven't read Craig Mullins, please do. Um, I got a chance to write. We, Craig and I are both aficionados of sword and sorcery films, and so one day we decided, well, okay, um, let's write one and and make it very sort of pseudo Robert E. Howard. And uh, so I said, well, I'll kick it off. I'll kick it off. I'll start. He said, have you ever written a book with someone before? I said, no. Have you? And he said, no, no. That's why I said, well, there's no rules. So let's. So I, I kicked it off, and then Craig wrote a bit, um, and it became very evident that's, that was how it was going to go. I'd write a chapter. He'd write a chapter. And uh, But then the problem was that Craig's tone is very different from mine. And I sort of thought, well, how can I? So I said, I'll tell you what. I won't, I won't, I hate to use the word polish, but I'll go back and I'll just change it a little bit to try and make the flow easier. And I did that, and he was very happy with what I did, so that's how we carried on. Like, I'd write a bit, he'd write one, I'd go back and rewrite his, write mine, go back, and and that's how The Last Barbarian, uh, which is a wonderful, uh, uh, was a wonderful experience uh, to write with Craig and, and to write that book. It was, it was sort of a... Uh, that, again, was like the death master for both of us, like putting everything we wanted to say into sort of a fantasy uh, barbarian story. But getting back to your question, yeah, straight to video was was something that was kicking around in my head. I, I, I'd met all these great authors, and they, we all seem to love the same types of cinema. And so I said, well, okay, um, what if we did an anthology which had everyone write their ultimate B-movie? And so um, I had the opportunity because I, by that time I was writing some short stories and, and poetry and things for anthologies at J. Ellington Ashton Press. And they gave me the opportunity to do um, this anthology if I could get enough people. And I, of course, I had the writers that I knew, but many other great writers I met during the, this sort of uh, year-long, over a year-long odyssey of putting the trilogy together. And so many came with wonderful, wonderful stories and wonderful ultimate B movies of their own. So it was quite, it was quite a, uh, it was quite a venture. Now you mentioned Jay Ellington uh, Press, and and uh, to to me that that they sort of evoke a, a horror sort of. Uh, Vibe. Yes, a lot of horror writers. Yeah, there, yeah. Are, are they are also what's been your experience? They're they're pretty open to, to bizarro kind of stuff. Are they looking to get into that? What are they doing there? I th- I think they're looking to get into it. I, I have signed a contract for a an exclusive um e uh, ebook exclusive bizarro ebook. They're doing a series of exclusive ebook bizarro titles. They do have a bizarro imprint. Um. And and I've got a book, uh, an exclusive ebook coming out with him. That's another bizarro story. It's kind of a um, a David Lynchian road trippy, uh, like if David Lynch directed a road trip fantasy uh, movie, it would be it would be in that vein. Wow, if David a, Lynch did The Wizard of Oz or something like that. That's great. And that sounds that sounds good. That they're they're willing to uh, to take the chance on on them. Bizarro stuff, because you don't see a lot of a lot of presses that don't get bizarro. Really, like I don't want any part of that if it's even a little yeah. bit weird. So that's that's good on them for for giving it a chance. And no, no, I, I believe that that they have an imprint for it and that they're trying to build on that. It's just that the most of their most of their, their body of authors are horror writers and they're part of the Horrors Writers Association, and so they do do a lot of horror. Horror is kind of their their main staple, but they they do have uh, they they do they are looking to branch out. I wanted to apologize too. I skipped right over the last barbarian there, and you're that's writer, all right. Craig Mullins is an exceptional writer, and you're right. His, his story, the reanimated states of America, was I mean that was really really good Lovecraftian storytelling modernized. I, I really like that book and what he's mm. done. And you know, I I need to check out the last bar. I, I have it. I've just never checked That's it right. out. It came in. That came out at a time where 
I was doing another podcast and, and reviewing so many books that it was like my head was going to explode. I just couldn't. Yeah. I was getting fed all these books I couldn't keep up with. I'll have to remember to to keep up yeah. with that. Now, who else do you besides Craig Mullins? Uh, have you worked with any other writers to you know collaborate with? Not, not that I've written a book with. No, um, uh, no, not not that I've not that I've, I've had a chance yet to to write another book with. I'd like to. It's, it was a good experience. Um, especially when both parties are so uh, passionate about the subject matter, it's very easy to write someone. Not, I mean, it helps that they're a very good writer as well, but it also helps that if they are equally as passionate about the subject matter, you know? Yeah, it, it is. I, I did a collaboration with a, a, a friend author, and it, it, it worked out rather well, and I was surprised because we were able to keep, like you said, you had to really find each other's voice to keep it sort of, you know, flowing and not so... Yeah, you, you have to keep the tone... Um, I mean, it, it can't be absolutely seamless because it's two different voices. Right. But it worked It worked out in our case because The Last Barbarian is essentially a chase. It's, it's a character chasing another character. So one character is, of course, very different from the other. So that that kind of helped with the blend because Craig was writing one character and I was writing the last barbarian. So his character was chasing me. So it, it, it worked it, to some points uh, an advantage that he had that slightly different voice, but to make the, the overall sort of tone of the piece sound similar, that was the only point where I sort of went in and, and did a bit of restructuring there to make it, to make it all seamlessly as far as tone was concerned. Concerned, sorry. So you had your you had your straight to video series. There's three of those out. Am I correct? That's right. Yes. Three of those out there. It's 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 weird because when I think straight to video, I think like 80s cheesy, you know, yep. teen movies. But you you do hit on that almost trauma like aspect of those straight to video cheapo movies and I, I it's oh, i love that kind of shitty cheap movie <laughs> yeah well me too i mean i love i love crap movies i love bad movies um but good bad movies i mean there's 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 crap movies there's good bad movies and there's just bloody awful movies but um i like those movies that most people just go oh well, that was crappy uh it's not they're gems in the junk um they're they're they really are and I wanted people, that was the flavor that we were going for. And, um, you know, it just, it just became such an odyssey. Like, I, I thought, okay, I'll do one. I've never done this before. I'll do one and see how it goes. And it went very well. Um, it was a lot, a lot of work. It was more work than I had anticipated um, because I also ended up writing a, a book called Sword Dude at the same time. Um which I don't know if you know about, it's for Dynatox uh, oh. Ministries. Yeah, I'm familiar with Dynatox. I'll be going to CrawlCon soon, but I didn't I didn't yeah. recognize that title. Yeah, yeah. Saw Dude was, uh, Jordan sent me a message kind of out of the blue. He said, oh, you're the guy that likes Deathstalker too. And I said, yeah. Uh, and he said, look, I'd like you to write something like that for me. And I said, oh, he said, look, is that I'd do these limited edition chat books and I said oh okay and I, he said do you have anything and I said well yeah I said I've got this story that's been sort of kicking around in my head for a while it's called Sword Dude it's about two out of work out of work barbarians that go on an adventure by mistake and he said good write it so I went away and <laughs> I, uh, yet again I pitched something that wasn't finished so I had to go away and and, and uh, it took me a week but I, I eventually uh, you know, fleshed it out and got it, got it to him, and out it came. Now, how do you? And, and the, sorry. Uh, how did you uh, like that experience of having like a limited edition chat book? Where you know, like I said, I didn't rec. I know Dynatox, and now I know why I didn't recognize it because it was a very limited edition run type of thing. Yeah, but, no, no, it was it was good um, because you know, I mean, it was it was nice in the respect that a pub. Uh, I don't know how other writers feel, but I was very humbled that he wanted me specifically. He said, I want you to write something for me, and I want you to write this type of story, because he said, I like these kind of films as well. 
And he, you know, I was very honoured. I was very honoured and humbled when he sort of said, "Well, look, I, I'd like you to write this kind of story for me." And I said, oh, "Well, okay, yeah," because I, I had I had the idea a long time. And uh, the title, I like, I like to like middle. I like to make little posters, and I stick them in front of the desk, you know. And I sit it there, and I had sword dudes stuck on the wall there for a long time. I thought I must get around to doing that. Um, and uh, and uh, and the opportunity uh, came along, and and, uh, and I got to do it. And um, yeah, it was it was great. And there have been some lovely reviews on Goodreads for it. People that have read it. So I think you can still get it on Lulu or, oh, or whatever cool. it is. Yeah, that must be it, it. Must be actually a little special too when when people do discover it and read it because it is such a you know limited edition, hard to find sort of thing. So even that must feel well, pretty it, good when some people find it and talk about it. Oh sure. Well, one of my my introduction to Joe Lansdale, one of my favorite authors, Joe R. Lansdale, was actually through a limited edition chat book. Uh, of his story on the far side of the Cadillac Desert with dead folks. And I thought that title alone is fantastic. That title alone is better than some people's short stories. <laughs> on the far side of the Cadillac Desert with dead folks. And I thought I read that and I thought, that's fantastic. And, of course, that led me to, to reading everything that Joe has done. Yeah. Um, and he's a big influence on me. He was he was also a, a, a dedicated uh, uh, alien smug peddlers to Joe Lane's death. Because he was very much in influence. That makes a lot um, of sense. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, it was nice to to be sort of in that thing that some person might find it eventually, you know, or get passed on. Might end up in a in a dusty sort of second hand bookstore at some point and 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 achieve a, a small portion of immortality that way. <laughs> it is a nice thought. It's a romantic thought, if nothing else. It is. It is. I mean, because. I mean, I don't know about yourself, but I've, I've visited many of these second-hand bookstores, and you find these books are authors that maybe only published one book or two books way back when in a dusty old paperback for 50 cents. And and here across uh, oceans of time and the annals of history, uh, this book has been picked up again and, and has new life for the time that you're reading it. So it's very, uh, it, it's a very romantic immortality. But it'd be nice to think that in the... In, in the future, some of these books might be discovered that way, and uh, and will live on for a little while longer. You're right, you can't do that with an ebook. No. Yeah, I got a lot of respect for Jordan's uh, unique business model. Yeah. No, he he was he was very. Uh, he he said, look, he said, I, he said, I, I don't care how much money it, it makes. He said, I, I want to pub. I publish this because I like it. And I was like, oh, that's good. He said, I, I, I said, I, I want to write something. That you like, and I said, "Did you? Do you like it?" He said, "That's why I want to publish it because that's what I like." So I said, "Well, that's good." You know, I said, "You know, that's 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 uh, nice to hear." Occasionally, I kind of like. And he said, "Probably, I don't care if it makes a ton of money." He said, "I'm publishing it because I like it." And I said, "Well, that's good." And I said, "I'm glad you like it." And it was it was nice to write it, and it was nice to be asked to write something. That's that's how I feel. I don't know, like I said, I don't know how other authors feel. But when, when someone who publishes books asks you, so I'd like you to write me a book. And I felt very humbled by that. I'll bet. I can only imagine. <laughs> I haven't experienced <laughs> it. Now, uh, moving on to what I've, I've seen you have coming out recently. You have this cinematic awesomeness series. Ah, the cinema of awesomeness, yes. Cinema of awesomeness. My apologies. Yes. Uh, Go on. Is it, is this, it looks like you're starting your own publishing venture. Is this what's going on? Yes, now now Kent Hill, author, publisher, yes. I had the opportunity to, to get into it. The third straight-to-video book came out through me because that was a massive... Um, the, the series was a massive task, but the third book alone was an odyssey unto itself. It is huge. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, over 500 pages. has uh, some of the, con the, the continuing... Stories, because the idea was that in each book, everyone would write a, the first film, and then they'd have the sequel, and the third one, they'd have the third film. Uh, so there was a necessity, because there were authors that had third parts to their story. Now, the um, it was the author, Nicholas Day, who said to me on the initial straight-to-video, 
you should get someone to write the forward. Someone, you know. And we were talking about the outlaw Vert and the film writer. And um, I said, well, I, d I don't know. I said, I'll, I'll try and get in touch with him. So I, tried, I got in touch with him and I sent him some material. I said, would you, would you be interested in writing the forward for this? And he said, oh, certainly. He said, this is fantastic. So he read some of it and, and he wrote a, a nice forward for it. And I thought, well, I better get a blurb because, you know, professional books have blurbs by famous people in the back. So who better, I thought, than Fred Olin Ray, the director of Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers, um, for the for the back. And I got in touch with, with Fred. And he said, oh, look, I'm just uh, off to, to do a movie in New York, but send me what you've got. And he said, I'll try to get you something before before I go. And he was very kind and generous and, and wrote us a little blurb for the back. So then the second book came along, and I thought, okay, well, I managed to do that for that one. Now I have to try and do it again. So I was already friends with Jim Winorski, and I was trying to get Jim to write the forward, but he was finishing up uh, Shark and Saw Women's Prison Massacre, so he was unable to do it. But he said, oh, he said I might be able to give you something at the back end of the book um, once I've finished. So I said, okay. Um... I need someone to write the forward. So I managed to get through to Sharknado. I'm a big Sharknado fan. Sharknado fans out there listening. Um, I got in touch with uh, Tony Ferretti, who directed the three films, and there he's working on the fourth film. And I, I said to Tony, I said, would you be interested? And he said, look, I'm, I'm editing it. At the time he was, he was still cutting Sharknado 3. And he said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm editing. But he said, What's, he said, look, send me your material and I'll try to do it in between while, I'm, while I've still got time while I'm editing. Because he said, once I go out and, and do the promotional stuff, I'll have no time. So I didn't hear from him for a couple of weeks and the next minute it, it came. And it was, he was very generous to give his time while I was editing. And oddly enough, that book came out around the same time as Shark No. 3. So it was very culturally relevant. Hmm. Um, so then the third book came along and so I thought, well, I'll try and finish this off. I'll do the same again. So I, I knew quite a few filmmakers and there was a few I got in touch with that I didn't know. Um, and I was only looking for the same one to write the forward, maybe one for a blow. But most of the ones that I reached out to all responded. Um, Vernon Wells, the star of The Road Warrior. Albert Pune, the director of The Sword and the Sorcerer. Um, Ed Newmeyer, the writer of Robocop, Russell Mulcahy, who directed Highlander, um, Philip, Mo Philip Mora, who directed The Howling 2 and 3, um, Richard Stanley, the director of Hardware, um, uh, Keith Vitale, star of Revenge of the Ninja, you know, I just went, I just kept reaching out and they kept responding, so I thought, wow, <laughs> we've really got, we've got more here than just a forward and a blurb. We could have like a commentary throughout the book, like a DVD commentary. We have a couple of stories and we have a filmmaker talking about the, their take on the straight-to-video era or the VHS era. And that's that project just blew up and it was huge. I thought, wow, we've got all these filmmakers with their little personal anecdotes. Um uh, Richard Stanley's was, was fantastic. It took six months to get hold of Richard because uh, he's a very jet-setting type character. He goes all around the place and getting different jobs. Uh, the, when I first spoke to him, he was in Japan. Uh, then he was back in France. Then he was in Canada. And he said, I haven't forgotten him. It's on, saved on my laptop. Um, just keep annoying me. Don't let me forget. And uh, lucky I didn't because his piece in the book was fantastic. He talks not only about his, his early experiences with, with watching movies on video, but a little about his career, about life living in apartheid-controlled uh, South Africa. Um, and it was just, it was phenomenal, as was Randall Frakes, the writer of Hell Comes to Frogtown, uh, was very generous. He actually also said, it's not in the book, but he sent me a copy of the memo when he was actually told to stay away from the picture you know, because he was he was so angry at the changes they were making. So the more producers get involved, the more cooks in the kitchen, it just spoils the broth. And so he actually sent me a copy of the memo uh, of the day he was he said, you know, 
you know, Randall Frakes is to stay away from the set and all that sort of stuff. So he was very a uh, wonderful bloke to talk to, and uh, was also wrote a wonderful piece for the book. But uh, yeah, so the cinema of real awesomeness was really born of this straight to video um, project because there was some stories in there. Uh, Kevin Candela's Weed Eaters. Um, uh, the wonderful Michael Kanaka, well, he's an author you're going to have to watch, he's a fantastic author with his story Black Tar um, Don Noble wonderful, wonder, my wonderful friend Don Noble and his Trailer Trash Samurai, they had larger versions that they couldn't really fit into the anthologies because we had to have <clears throat> some type of semblance of a word limit um, so they have done expanded versions of their stories, and so they're coming out as, as individual releases in Kevin's The Complete Acropolis. Uh, he has all six Weed Eater stories. Um, Michael has expanded Black Tar, um, and as has Don Noble expanded um, Trailer Trash Samurai. And uh, myself getting a chance to do a little bit of writing again for a chance to expand on my short story that was in the first one, Hercules with a shotgun. That sounds that sounds all really incredible, and it's it's like it's just a project on a gigantic scale. The scope of it is pretty amazing. Yeah, it just it it just blew up. It was it started off like oh, I had a chance to do an anthology. Oh, this is good, and it came together really well. And then a lot of the authors said, well, why don't we do a second one? And we could write sequels to our our, our, our films that we've written. And I said, oh, okay. Well, okay, well, we'll do another one. And then the, the second one came together really well. And I said, well, we should do a third one. We should do, yeah, we have to do a trilogy now. So, yeah, and like I said, the trilogy just exploded into something completely different because mm-hmm. I had all these filmmakers interested in being a part of it. And I thought, well, how can I include... We can't have, like, 13 forwards. Um, <laughs> so I thought well, all of their pieces were very individual. So I thought, well, if we, we space them out like a commentary through the book. So you have a couple of stories, then you have a filmmaker sort of sounding off on on the era of, of, of video and what it meant to them and their careers or, or their personal experiences with films on VHS and that era, so yeah, it was it was just it just grew and grew and grew. Yeah. Um, like I said, the, the the whole project was huge, but the third book was an odyssey unto itself. And now they're expanding out even to their own standalone works. Yeah, yeah. Now it's now it's almost like Star Wars. Like you've got <laughs> the initial films, and then you've got the 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 spin off films. Yeah. In between. So, Man, that's so, that's yeah. really awesome. Now that you you have. You know, grabbed a foothold in in publishing. What what's the what's the scene there in Australia since you first sort of started hunting out publishers? Well, there's not too many, and certainly not of the models like there are in the US. They're very few and far between, and they're very small. I mean, KHP is very very small. It's me, me myself, and I, um, <laughs> and and my laptop. Um, so yeah, so it's a, it's a it's a we're, we're small, but there's room for aggressive expansion. Um, <laughs> but um, so yeah, no, the 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 scene here is very tiny. And do you, um, do you find you have to just market to the U.S. like you don't you know? Have oh a- sure, sure. There was no, I couldn't get anyone to hardly to read any of my work initially. Because they kept floating this thing, oh, you're too high concept, too high concept. It was very similar to the film industry back when I was involved with it. Anything that was high concept was like, oh, that's 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 big budget. That's Americans do that better. We leave that to them. You know, we need small, uh, culturally culturally relevant films. And I said, what you mean a a movie made in the backyard with a koala bear climbing up the tree or something? <laughs> And um, I said, we, we used to have, if you watch uh, people listening, if you watch a film, uh, called, it's called Not Quite Hollywood, it's a documentary about the um, the era of ausploitation 
films. We had a thriving exploitation cinema here in the 70s and early 80s. And it just disappeared because all of a sudden we had to be, or, or, you know, the, the, the governing body said that we had to be more respectable. But we had a thriving um, exploitation cinema. And, I mean, let's face it, there would not be, um, you know, the post-apocalyptic action movies that there are in the world if it weren't for Mad Max and the Road Warrior. And uh, we, we had this type of industry. Uh, and we yet now it seems almost taboo, like you want to make a, an exploitation movie or you want to write a, a high-concept genre book. It's, it's, it seems like it's a dirty word. And I just thought, well, it's it's terrible because there's a lot of people out there wanting to do it. I met two wonderful gentlemen at a convention that I was at in November last year that are trying to do, I don't know if you're familiar with the outlaw, Ned Kelly, the guy who wore the big tin helmet on his head. Sure. They're trying, they're trying to do a Ned Kelly versus zombies. It's Ned Kelly in a dystopian future where the zombies are intelligent zombies and they're basically formed government and Ned Kelly leads the human resistance and it's called a man, the man called Ned and it's a wonderful concept. The, uh, the artist of the graphic novel they're trying to launch um, actually did the covers for the Cinema of Awesomeness, Awesomeness series His named Zach Smith Cameron. He's a fabulous comic book artist. And, uh, and I mean, they have to do all this independently. They're, they're eventually probably going to do a, a, like a crowd-funded thing to try and get their graphic novel off the ground because uh, the powers that be are not interested. Most, most uh, comic books here are, uh, or the, the Australian comic book industry is all a lot of self-funded and crowd-funded stuff because... The, the publishers that exist are only interested in the mainstream conventional fair, which is not all there is. It's almost like a supermarket catalogue. Like if, if we only lived by what's in the supermarket catalogue, you know, there, there are so many other things that you can buy. It's not, if it's not in the catalogue, that, that, that we're trying to be convinced, I feel, all the time that if it's not in the catalogue, it doesn't exist. Hmm. But it does exist. There are worlds within worlds and there are alternatives, and the edge is still out there, and we have to keep pushing towards it. It, it almost sounds like it's it's built into the culture not not to be creative and experimental. Is it is it that type of a situation? Um, no, I, I just think I, I think that it was. Uh, let's face it to to keep a to keep a country. Uh, governed and under control you, you have to you have to exert sort of rules and regulations and I think that during that period where there was exploitation and experimentation in the cinema here um, they saw it as being very out of control because uh, and let's face it a lot of those filmmakers and a lot of that talent did disappear overseas because um, there was just nothing nothing to hold them here and it's still the case. Like, I, I had to go to do... I, I would have liked to have been published here, but I, I had to go where the love was, and the love was in it was in the United States. And have, have you ever had a, had a chance to come over to the U.S.? No, I'd like to. I'd like to very much. I'd like to go to some of these uh, conventions and and meet a lot, meet basically everyone that I've collaborated with, <laughs> practically. Um, because yeah, I, I, I need to owe them some of the money through Facebook, some of the money through emails, and and uh, I've had phone calls with a few of them, but I don't. Uh, apart from that, we are uh, we are physically strangers, uh, <laughs> but uh, but we work together, and uh, I work with a lot of wonderful people, wonderful writers, wonderful artists. Uh, Gary McCluskey's one of them. Did all my early books. Um, Brian LeBlanc, who's a master artist, he did uh, Sword Dude, he did The Last Barbarian, he did the Straight to Video series. Um, all the writers that I've been involved with, Candela, Noble, Carnuckle, uh, Vaughn, um, geez, I, I'm going to leave people out, Terry West, um, 
goodness, I should just get the book out and just read from the contents. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but uh, no, I've worked with, with so many wonderful people and wonderful artists and wonderful creative people. And it's, um, I would like to eventually get over there and, and shake a couple of hands and buy a couple of beers because they've definitely earned it. I, I mean, it, it's incredible to, to hear the, the network you've built, not only of writers, but of filmmakers also, and, and to get them all involved in these projects. It's a pretty incredible feat considering you're doing it from a, practically a lonely corner of the world, all things considered. That's true. The lonely corner in a lonely room uh, from, from the other side of the world, yes, it's... Um, it hasn't been easy. Don't 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 let me try and sell it to you as if it's been uh, all wine and roses because it hasn't. But uh, it's definitely been um, it's a feat, and I'm I'm very proud of all the books. I'm glad people are reading them, enjoying them. I'm happy that people even don't like them, you know, because usually when they don't like them, they still have quite a lot to say. Uh, um, I was asked when I did a, a a print interview for the Bizarro fans page uh melanie asked me to do um a uh, a print interview for her bizarro fans page and one of the questions was what's your favorite one star review and i have this wonderful one star review for smart peddlers and this person not only says what they hated about the book but they go into quite detail about why they hated it so that was uh, it was great because i love that extreme like it still made her think enough to write such a massive review about why she didn't like it. You know, usually the ones that do like it is very short, like, oh, I love this, it's so funny and weird. But this was a massive review about why she didn't like it. So that was that was great. I love the extremes. Like People either like it or they hate it. It's it's you fantastic know? when you can evoke emotion one way or another. I know, you know, I'm, I'm fond of anything I read, I review. And some of my favorite reviews that I've written for myself are the one-star reviews where I'm just so wound up and ticked off that I had yeah. <laughs> to go through these books. So, I, you know, I have, I have fun with it. But, you know, it is – I think it's important, those one-star reviews, to you know, to be critical and, and to give, you know, your sure. honest sure. opinion, obviously. Not and every I mean, book I, is for everybody. I, when I, I remember when I wrote – sorry for cutting you off there. I remember when I, um, I did the book uh, Zombie Park and um, – I don't know if it's it's my penchant to 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 do these books like B movies and have a very very good cover, but when you actually watch the film or read the book, it's not quite as good as the cover. Um, <laughs> but um, Zombie Park was great. There was a review for that that um, this one person said, oh, "I wish to you know the the cover was so enticing. And this guy's not funny at all. He he's trying to be funny, but he can't." And uh, <laughs> it, it was great because, I mean, the gestation of Zombie Park was I was sitting one day and I was trying to think of something to write next because everyone was, was waiting for something after Death Master. And I looked over at the TV and there was four DVDs on the edge of the TV set. And it was um, Aliens, Predator, and Jurassic Park and Highlander. And so I thought, there you go. I'll try and mash all those into some sort of story. And that was basically, it was written in, a couple of days and, you know, <laughs> I mean, uh, th these aren't, like I said, these aren't great literary masterpieces. They're literary junk food. So <laughs> you, you shouldn't take them too seriously. You should just enjoy it and have a laugh. And if you don't think I'm funny, well, I apologize. That's that's great. And unfortunately, I have to say we're already out of time. So that's a pretty good thought to end on, you know. Well, it's like John Carpenter said, you know, um, they're my movies. You may like them, you may hate them but they're my movies. And uh, I, I look, I, 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 I just hope that, that people, if, you know, there's, there's places in there to have fun. And if you have fun and if you enjoy reading it, then my work is done. There it is. Not everything has to be war and peace. No, no. Shit, no, I just, yeah, I don't have the patience to sit and write that. <laughs> I don't have the patience to sit and read it. <laughs> Kent Hill, I want to thank you very much for coming on the song and talking to us from clear across the globe. Thank you, Mr. Frank, and thank you, Zongers, out there for your attention. Well, there you go. Uh, Continued success in all you do. I can't wait to see all these new movie books you put out. Uh, everything looks pretty exciting. 
I hope everybody gets a chance to check out all this great stuff Kent Hill is putting out. Thank you again for coming on Bazong. Thank you, sir. So there he is, Zongers, Mr. Kent Hill. Very tenacious, very talented, and loving writer. He loves Bizarro, and he's dedicated to putting his brand of, of exploitation. I think, is what he brings to the world of, of Bizarro and weird fiction. So keep an eye out for Kent Hill and all his stuff. Zongers, next week, huge, big, huge, big, giant name coming on the podcast. Big interview. Can't wait to unleash it on you. Until then, go visit patreon.com slash Project I Radio and lend us some of your hard-earned dollars. We're working very hard here on the network to bring you the best, most highest quality programming for free. But, of course, we need your help to continue bringing the great shows that are already on the network and bring in more great shows to the network. I know you guys are loving everything that Project iRadio is putting out here. So if you could just give us a buck, give us two bucks, give us ten bucks, you'll get that great ebook subscription plan. My book, Scared Silly, is going to be part of it. If there's a reason to give $10, I don't know what other reason there is. Oh, yeah, there's people like Brian Keene, Jonathan Mayberry, Mark Tufo. They're all lending ebooks to the plan. All great writers. So please, if you can afford $10, or if you can just afford $1, you don't have to do it every month, just a couple of months, just give us $1, whatever it is you're able to help out to keep these great podcasts out there for the world to hear. Zongers, until next week, don't forget to check out this great show on the Project iRadio Network. Hi, this is Brian Keene. I'm an international best-selling, award-winning horror novelist and comic book writer. No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother for the My stories have been turned into movies. I've even spoken inside CIA headquarters. Fire, no comment! Don't you understand? I've worked in this industry for 20 years and I know everybody. More importantly, I know where the bodies are buried. And now I'm telling you their location every week on The Horror Show. You understand this? Plus, we discuss the latest news in horror novels, movies, comics, and games, and interview the biggest names in the business. This interview is over. No comment. The f- Join us on The Horror Show, Thursday nights, 7 p.m., only on Project I Radio. Brian Keene was also unavailable for comment. of doom on project i radio i am your host kelly owen i'm just a girl a girl who writes horror and thriller fiction talks to bugs jumps in puddles and now hosts a weekly podcast full of opinions advice and a touch of gypsy wisdom whether it's current affairs or social media nightmares join me the buttercup of doom mondays on project i radio